militarization then. Um, indeed, like you, like you said, US bases um, uh, uh, flowered absolutely, well, not flowers are one word, isn't it? Appeared absolutely everywhere. I don't think there's a continent in the world that hasn't got a US military base in it. Um, a few years ago, I was trying to find out actually how many US bases exist um, for a piece that I was writing. And it turned out to be one of the hardest things to do because they don't keep official records. Um, but needless to say, there's absolutely thousands. In terms of Latin America, it's an interesting one. What we've seen in Latin America in the, in the last few years has been a move to progressive governments by some countries, such as Venezuela, Ecuador, Bolivia, Nicaragua, Argentina, um, Brazil. Um, so the United States in some places have lost its stronghold. Um, there's a brilliant story about when Correa decided to close the US military base in Manifest um, when he came into office. And um, this was a few years ago. And so he said to the US, we're going to close this base. <coughs> and the US was fuming. And they said, well, well, no, we can't close this base. He said, no, we're going to close this base. It's, it shouldn't be on Ecuadorian <coughs> soil. We're going to close it. So it turned into a big, big argument. And the United States started their bullying tactics of threatening Ecuador, but Correa wasn't having any of it. And he said, it's just not happening. We're going to close it. So the United States said to them, OK, um, is there any way that you would negotiate around this? Okay, yeah, okay, I'll, I can think of a, of a way we can negotiate this. And the United States was thinking, brilliant, okay, under what conditions would you allow us to have a US base? And Correa turned around and said, I'll allow you to have a US base in Ecuador if you like allow Ecuador to have a base in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> and I want it in Miami. <laughs> And needless to say, that was the last of the bases in Ecuador. <laughs> so, but at the same time, we had, um, we've obviously got bases in, being open in Colombia, in Chile now, in Mexico. Um, there was a new seven bases that was opened up um, just as the ruby was going out of power. Ruby was going out of power, actually, in Colombia. And Santos was coming in, and, and luckily the Colombian parliament turned around and said, well, that, this was never came through, we're going to have to negotiate it again. Um, and the training plan that you mentioned, I think, is really important. And again, I didn't have time to touch on this in my presentation, but all these Pinochet and the, and the generals and the torturers and the high-level personnel in the army and the police force that did all these atrocities in Chile were all trained in what now is known as the School of the Americas. Now, School of the Americas was like a training. It was a training camp for torturers and murderers. They trained you how to assassinate people how to intimidate citizens, how to make people disappear. Um, some documents that were declassified a few years ago actually showed the, 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 the manuals that was used in some of these courses, and they were akin to Nazi, Nazi style form of torture. Um, and the School of the Americas continues to train these kind of, they've renamed it now, because there was a massive campaigning group set up in the United States. It was actually based there to get it closed. And so now they've renamed it, I forget the name that they've given it. So it still exists, it's just got a different name. So it's got a long history of training torturers and murderers to then go in and execute um, their policies. Um, and death squads equally. Um, so there's a real need to actually bring this to the forefront. And US citizens in their, some US citizens in their, in their um, defense have been fighting against this in the United States. But as long as they're allowed to continue to do so, unfortunately, that stronghold on Latin American countries, not just Latin America, in other countries in the world, no doubt, is going to continue. But what we do see in Latin America now is a few governments saying we're not, we're not doing this anymore. And actually, Latin America integration that we've seen via organisations such as ALBA is where governments are coming together and not only saying no to the United States in terms of military, but saying no to IMF, which is you know, the example that Germany was given about Jamaica, saying no to the World Bank. And basically untying themselves from the acres of the imperial, you know, the imperial master and saying, we're, when we want in, what we mean by independence is complete independence. We don't want to be bound by your military and economic structures anymore. Um, sadly, Chile is yet to catch up with that and because of the government we've got, but we'll see what happens with the next government. Which leads me to the question about student protest, actually. Um, the student protest has been incredible for Chile. It really has been a, re a reawakening of consciousness and the movement that existed during the 
through my parents' times, or what I've been talking about earlier on. Um, and they're fighting the neoliberal you know, system, the neoliberal model of education, the model that made education a commodity. Mm. Um, and among my words, that's what's happening here in Britain. Mm. You know, it started with higher education, but the idea of free schools, mm. you're seeing the marketization of education, and that's where you need to le learn from what happened in Chile, because what our neoliberal model is what you guys are getting now, and the disastrous consequences of it is what you guys are going to get next. And the students have recognised that and done an amazing campaign to highlight the problem with neoliberalism and the devastation it has on the education system and said, we don't want this anymore. And this amazing generation, because they're not Pinochet's generation, and they're not Vigende's generation, they're post that. Yeah. But, so they were able to come, be disconnected from that, but still recognise the problems of the system. Um, I mean, the leader, Camila Vallejo, has been amazing. She, I think now, I've heard of my going for Senate, which is brilliant, which is excellent. She's an amazing speaker, an amazing leader for the students. Um, and what's interesting is there's presidential campaigns going on in Chile now with two women. Um, one, who <coughs> Joey already spoke about, whose father was in the armed forces, was against Pinochet and was murdered and her and herself and her mother was tortured. And the other one, her opposition, which is the right-wing candidate, her father was in the military and joined in the military dictatorship and was applauded by Pinochet, very distinct uh, candidates. And in there, they lies the juxtaposition of Chile, I think. But Bachelet, the left-wing candidate, has included the students' demands in her manifesto. <coughs> So this, I think the politicians can no longer ignore such as being the support for the students because then followed the teachers and followed the, the ordinary men and women that come out and support the students. So I think we've had a massive, mass, uh, massive um, achievement in bringing the agenda to the forefront. Whether or not they get, there's been a few policy, you know, a few <coughs> things kind of to try and appease them, but they've not yet achieved what they want to achieve, which is free education of a high cost standard available to all. Not yet seen that, but I've got hope that that's what they're going to achieve. <coughs> certainly.